Today, uh, we actually, because uh, normally on uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we would take a break from what we're normally studying to uh, just look at the resurrection. But as God providentially led us, we happen to be in a resurrection passage today in our study of 1 Corinthians. So we're not going to take a break. We're going to dive right into where the text has us because it speaks directly to uh, what this day is all about. So why don't you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one uh, in the chair in front of you in that little pocket. Um, feel free to take that home with you. We want you to have a Bible, and that's our gift to you. But why don't you uh, stand up, and we'll read this together. I'll, I'll read it, and then we'll pray. We'll get into our message for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed." Let's pray. Father, what a fantastic scripture for us to look at this morning. And I pray as we talk about the gospel, that the gospel would be believed by every single one of us in this room and beyond today. The gospel, Lord, is not just for the lost, it is for the saved. Because we need to know how Christ died for our sins, was buried and is risen from the dead. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So happy Resurrection Sunday. Today is Easter, the day that Christians around the world celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It is the day that marks Christianity apart from every religion in the world. It is the day without which we would not have Christianity. Although Christmas gets far more press, a lot more cultural attention. It's got a full month plus designated for special shopping and music and that sort of thing. Easter has far more importance. After all, Christmas is only special because Jesus rose from the dead. If he did not, then nobody would have really cared if he was born or how he was born. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pivotal event of history, and it's the event that we celebrate this day and it's really why the church meets on Sunday instead of Saturday all through the year. So what's the big deal? The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is what makes the gospel the gospel. Without Jesus rising from the dead, there is no good news to share about him. Without Jesus' resurrection, we have no proof of his victory over death. We have no declaration of his deity. We have no eyewitness apostles. We have no reason for Paul to traipse around the Roman Empire. We've got nothing. Without Jesus' resurrection, we have no news to share, much less good news. At that point, all we have is the reality of our sins against a holy God with no way of resolving them. We are left with hopelessness. We are left with judgment. We are left with the futile religions of men trying to prove ourselves righteous and always failing. Those who try to earn their way to heaven are like trucks that get stuck in the mud. Mud spinning their wheels wildly, getting only dirtier, getting only deeper into the muck. We need a rescue. We need a rescuer. And without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have none. But praise God, Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is alive today just as he has been alive for nearly 2,000 years since he first came out of the Jerusalem tomb. And because he is, we have good news to share good news to believe and not just kind of good news it's the best news the news of god's salvation 
Now, this is the news that Paul shared with the Corinthian church at the beginning of chapter 15. Paul had just concluded his discussion of spiritual gifts, and that came on the heels of a longer discussion of orderly worship within the local church. And on a broader scale of the book, this was the part of a section of the letter where Paul was answering some specific questions that had come from this local church congregation and subjects he addressed after dealing with several issues of discipline. Paul had covered a full array of topics with this church ranging from internal division to marriages to prophecy, everything in between. At this point in the letter, uh, really broad scheme, Paul's starting to bring things to a close, but as he does, he addresses one more major, major subject. And this is something he's had in mind really since the letter's very beginning. All the way back in chapter 1, Paul wrote how the message of the cross was foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Chapter 1, verse 18. Some of the Christians in Corinth have begun to stumble on some of the basics of the gospel itself. And this is something that's foundational to our faith, without which we cannot be saved. And so now with all those other issues dealt with out of the way, Paul turns to that which is most important, the wisdom of God as seen in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it quickly becomes apparent, as we'll get into chapter 15, that the primary stumbling block of some of those in Corinth was the physical, literal resurrection of Jesus Christ as well as the ramifications that that held for the resurrections of those who believe. But before Paul can look at the details of the resurrection, he first needs to establish its place within the gospel message. And that's what he does here at the beginning of chapter 15, because he's reminding the Christians in Corinth about the centrality of the gospel to the Christian faith. It is a marvelous text for us to examine on Resurrection Sunday. The events that took place that glorious Sunday morning make it possible for us to be saved. The things that took place that day ensure that there is a gospel to share, that there's good news to tell. We have good news, it's glorious. It is, as we'll find out, it is foundational, it is factual, it is transformational. It is essential to everything that we have in God, and we find it's all about Jesus. So we praise God this Resurrection Sunday for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we'll start with how the gospel is foundational, really in verses 1 and 2, but just the first part of verse 1 here. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. Stop there. What's the first thing that Paul wrote about the gospel? He says, I've already preached it. I've already preached it to you in Corinth. He was about to preach it to them all over again. One of the oldest strategies, the first lessons you learn in uh, public speaking and communication is you tell them what you're about to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Well, Paul's in the tell them what you told him face. He had already told them, he gave them the gospel, so what he's about to write to them should sound very, very familiar. Why? Because it's not going to change. What Paul had already declared, that's what he was going to write. Why? Because the gospel never changes. No matter who our audience is, no matter what the preferences of our overall culture might be, the message of Jesus does not change. Now, certain methods of sharing the news might but the message, the content, does not. Well, how so? Well, today, for instance, we have technology of which Paul could not have imagined. Paul's method of worldwide publishing was to write a letter by hand, have a bunch of people copy it, and then send the copies around the Roman Empire individually, hand-carrying it to these various cities as they went from church to church. People were walking there. Today, we go to our computer, or better yet, we have our cell phone, we put in a few buttons and we push a button on Facebook or Twitter and it goes out to a worldwide audience immediately. Paul preached and he preached in many, many cities. But guess what? He only preached at one place at one time. For us, you've got a cell phone, you go to a global live stream instantly. Our methods are incredibly advanced and even the media can vary. In addition to the spoken and written word or video, infographics, picture books, more. I've seen things like Rubik Cube type Puzzles and such being used to share the gospel. The news of Jesus goes out in a myriad of ways undreamt of by Paul or any of the original apostles. Those methods change, but the message does not. The content does not change. It must not change. The gospel is what the gospel is, and we have neither the right nor the authority to alter it. Some want to water it down, hoping to find a way to make it more palatable to the world, or at least less offensive as it might be perceived. Uh, that's not our job. That's not in our purview. We are stewards of the news, not the originators of it. We're not the owners of it. 
we cannot change what God has set forth. So, beloved, beware that you do not change the message. And likewise, beware any pastor, any teacher, any evangelist who attempts to change the message. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul put a warning uh, to the church in the strongest of terms. And he said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, But if we, including himself, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Again, as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. How important is it to keep the message of the gospel unchanged? So much so that even if the apostle Paul himself changed it, he was under the curse of God. Let us beware. Let us be careful to leave the gospel intact as given to us in the scripture. All right. That's a lot of talking about the message of the gospel. What about the message itself? Well, Paul's going to get to the details, but let's take a look at the big picture. Because he says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. The words gospel and breached come from the same root word in the Greek. You could literally translate this. I declare to you the gospel which I gospelized to you. The noun is euangelion. You might hear the word evangelism. And that, that's where we get our word evangelism. It's a compound word, or at least a strengthened form of one word, but it places the word for good, or at least one word for good, in front of another word used for news or declaration. That word used, news and declaration, that's actually uh, where we get our word angel from, because an angel is nothing but a messenger, somebody carrying a message from God. The angel brings divine news. So you put it together, you get the good news, right? The ooh angel evangel you may have heard that word that's that word here the good news of god concerning jesus christ what does this matter because we tend to use the word gospel as an adjective for all sorts of things there's gospel music gospel literature gospel action gospel fill in the blank as if it's just another word in a christian version of mad libs right and that's just a church in the culture it uses the word in a different way it's just a synonym for truth we might read a book that purports to be the gospel about politics, the gospel about a particular sport, or all kinds of things. This needs to stop. We need to understand this foundational point. The true gospel speaks only of Jesus Christ. If we are not referring to Jesus, we are not referring to the gospel at all. We should not allow this glorious word to be so easily diluted in our speech. Jesus is the gospel, the good news of God. Anything less is not the gospel. So how central is this gospel message to the church in Corinth? We go on in verse 1 and verse 2. Which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. The Corinthians received the news of Jesus. They did not reject it. They believed it as Paul declared it. Likewise, they stood in the news of Jesus, having planted their feet in the, tr uh, feet, planted their feet in the truth that was preached, not moving from that spot of faith. And because of this, they were currently being saved by or through or via that same news of Jesus. The ESV actually brings out that present tense grammar in verse 2, which is there, by which you are being saved. More than a, a one-time act of forgiveness, the effect of the gospel of Jesus on those Christians was present, it was ongoing. This brings to mind how we saw in the book of Romans especially, but we've also seen in the book of 1 Corinthians, the Bible speaks of salvation in three tenses, past, present, future. We are saved from our sins of the past by being justified by Jesus Christ. His death on the cross uh, serves as a punishment for our sins. And when we place our faith in him, he justifies us. He wipes out our debt against God. Second, we are presently being saved from our sinful nature in the process of sanctification. And this Jesus frees us from the power that our sinful nature has over us so that we need not get it, give in to that slavery of temptation. And then third, we will be saved in the future and that day when we're removed from the very presence of sin through the act of glorification. One day our bodies will be resurrected along, of course, with Jesus, to be with Jesus. Paul is going to address that later in the chapter. And in that day we will live in Jesus' kingdom altogether free from our sinful condition. Now Paul's point here for Corinth is that they're already experienced or experiencing those first two tenses. Because they received the gospel and stood in it, they were justified by Christ. They were truly forgiven of their sins. They were made new creations by the grace of God. And because of their current faith, their ongoing faith, they were currently being saved, continually sanctified by the grace of God as they're being made more and more into the likeness of Jesus. 
God had done and was doing a mighty work among them in which they could rejoice. But there's one disclaimer as he finishes out in verse 2. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believe in vain. Now that if stands out in a major way. Now all of what Paul wrote for Corinth was absolutely true if they held fast to the gospel. Now it needs to be pointed out by the grammar used by Paul. It indicates this is not a fear of his for this church. He was certain that this was indeed the belief for the Corinthians. The, the grammar indicates that here. But even so, their one guarantee of their salvation is to hold fast to the gospel preached to them, not being those who believed in vain. Now make no mistake, there are some who believe in vain. There are people who walk through the doors of a church building who know all the right words, can even recite basic biblical doctrine about Jesus, particularly on an Easter Sunday morning, yet who do not themselves hold fast to the message. They do not believe. For them, the words they speak are empty words. The faith that they present is just a facade. And there's a theological term for that kind of person. It's a false convert. Maybe a guy raised his hand during a preacher's invitation wanting to go to heaven, but he didn't surrender himself to Jesus to be his Lord. Maybe a, a lady was told she could fill the spiritual void in her heart, but she didn't turn away from her sins to follow Jesus. She never believed upon Christ for who he is. Whatever their faith was in, it was not in the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified for their sins, risen from the dead. They may have believed in something, but they didn't believe in the gospel. So all their other belief was in vain. Please do not let that be you. Especially on Resurrection Sunday, take the time to examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Take a hard look at your beliefs to determine if you hold fast to that gospel, the good news about Jesus, because only those who do have any assurance of salvation. If your hope in Jesus is based on anything other than Jesus, if your hope of heaven is based on anything other than what the Lord Jesus Christ has done and who the Lord Jesus Christ is, then you have no hope of heaven at all. At that point, you are not being saved. But you can be. You want to hold fast to the gospel of Christ. This is foundational. You can't get much more important than this. This is the access that we have to the promises of God. It is the assurance of our deliverance from sin and our future in the presence of God. It is essential to believe this gospel is essential to keep. Well, what's the message? It's the factual testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what we pick up in verses 3 through 8. The gospel is factual. Paul first says in verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. So in verse 1, Paul wrote of how he preached the gospel to the church of Corinth, as this is the message that he was going to deliver to them all over again. Well, guess what? It was a message that had been delivered to Paul himself. Paul did not invent the message. He, like every other gospel preacher, was a messenger. It had been given to him. He passed it on to others. This tells us something important, that Paul received the message, confirms that it existed long before the writing of the letter of 1 Corinthians. Paul likely learned it, this particular formulation. He learned that from the initial Christians he met in Damascus following his own conversion some 20 years earlier. Now, considering that Paul wrote this letter around 54 to 55 A.D., having first ministered in the city around 51 A.D., we can place his conversion somewhere around 36 A.D. That means a fully formed Christian creed, or confession of faith, existed outside of Jerusalem within three to five years of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Now, for all the skeptics out there who claim that the story of Jesus' resurrection was a myth that developed over time, the historical facts just do not present that as a possibility. It takes years, it takes even decades for myths to develop. In this case, doctrine was being formulated and taught within only a couple of years from the event itself. We have presidential terms that last longer than what it took for the gospel to be systematically taught to new believers. It underscores the idea that the gospel is historical fact. The good news of God is not too good to be true. It's good because it is true. All right, so let's look at that message. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We're going to take some time to break that down. It starts off with Christ. 
Note that Paul gives a title rather than a name. Not that anything's wrong with the name of Jesus, far from it. The name Jesus, just translating, it encapsulates the gospel itself. It means Yahweh is salvation, or the short and firm of Yah saves. Uh, this was a name specifically designated by God during Mary's pregnancy for his only begotten son. It is a name that's above every other name. It's wonderful. But for Paul's purposes here, it's also wonderfully common. Jesus is the anglicized Greek version of Joshua, a name extremely common among the first century Jews. Imagine if Paul wrote, Josh died for our sins according to the scriptures. Theologically correct, but his readers might have asked, okay, great, which one? They may have known a dozen men named Joshua or Jesus, so they needed some distinction. Now, Paul could have done this legitimately by saying Jesus of Nazareth. That's the name that Peter used the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, Acts 2.22, but he didn't. Here he wrote Christ. Why? Because this specific title has a specific meaning. The Christ is the Messiah, the man anointed by God to be king of Israel, to be savior of the world. The Christ, the Messiah, is the man to whom Scripture points as the fulfillment of all of the promises of God going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This is a person of great importance. This is the man upon whom rests the fate of the universe. This is a man at the center of the good news of God. The gospel, of course, is all about Christ. Just to emphasize the point, don't gloss over that. The gospel is not about life fulfillment. It's not about good feelings. It's not about material riches. It's not about anything that this world can offer. The gospel, by the way, although it sounds strange, the gospel is not ultimately about eternal life in heaven. That's a benefit of the gospel, but that's not the gospel itself. The gospel is about Christ. It is about the Lord Jesus of Nazareth as God's Messiah. It's about who he is and what he has done. The good news of God is all about him, not about us. Now, this gets back to the idea and the warning against us changing the gospel. If we make it about us and all that we can get out of God, then we're no longer preaching, maybe no longer believing the gospel. If the preaching is all about seeing what we can gain, prosperity or physical healing, supernatural power, whatever, that is not gospel preaching because true gospel preaching is going to be about Jesus as the Christ. We cannot dilute that message. We must not diverge from it. It's far too important. Okay, so what did Christ do? First, he says Christ died. Again, remember whom it is that we're speaking of. It's Christ. Christ the King. Christ the Messiah. The anointed one of God. The God-man himself died. The one who existed before time began. The second person of the Trinity who had no beginning. The one through whom God created the world this man died. That enough is to blow our minds, right? It's incredible. How is it possible that the Christ could die? Now, without question, this was unthinkable in the minds of the first century Jews. Now, they anticipated Messiah's arrival. They were looking forward to a great military victory that he'd bring to the Romans, over the Romans, restore their land to independence, restore the kingdom of Israel to prominence. Certainly, that was on the minds of the original disciples. That's why they scattered so quickly when Jesus was arrested. They, they hid themselves behind locked doors when Jesus died on the cross because with that, all their hopes died. Their hopes for the messianic reign had been dashed, so they thought. The man whom they trusted was gone. He was bruised. He was beaten. He was nailed to the cross, and it was upon the cross that he died. And the weight of that fact was crushing to them. We look back 2,000 years later and we kind of chastise them in our minds. Say, you know, but Jesus warned them about this. They should have listened. You know, they should have, but you wouldn't have listened either. They were humans just like us. They did not want to believe that Jesus could suffer and die on the cross, but he did, and they were devastated. But there's a reason for Jesus' death, one which we dare not forget, because this too is part of the gospel. Specifically, what did Paul write? Christ died for our sins. Now, this is what we remember on Good Friday, and though we dare not limit it to Good Friday. Jesus died as a sacrifice, as a substitution. And this is why it had to be Christ and not just anyone. Because it was Jesus, because it was the Son of God incarnate as the Christ, the death that Jesus died served as a sufficient substitute for sinful people like you and me. Now, Admittedly, this is kind of difficult for some of us to relate to, especially as 21st century Western people. 
coming from a primarily Gentile culture, we have a difficult time understanding the need for sacrifice. To us, sacrifice is just something we give to somebody else. It might even be valuable. We talk about a sacrifice of time, a sacrifice of money. It, it might even include a life. We talk about a soldier sacrificing his life or her life for the country that, that he's serving in. But that's a one-sided sacrifice. That's something that doesn't have any kind of correlating response. To the ancient Hebrews following the law of Moses, sacrifice is something far different. That kind of sacrifice did something. And this kind of sacrifice required blood. It required the life of an animal that served as a judicial substitute for one's own sins. So you had sinned against God, and the wages of your sin was death, but you obviously cannot personally pay that price for obvious reasons. So you put an animal in your place, and the death that you should have received was administered to that animal so you could live. And you knew that the blood that came pouring out from that animal's neck as it was slain, that should have been yours. Of course, there's a problem. You kept sinning. So you had to keep giving animal sacrifices. Moreover, the value of an animal, as much as we love our pets, the value of an animal never equals the value of a person. Thus, a sacrifice is always insufficient. This is where the death of Christ comes in. His sacrifice is sufficient. The death that he gave was given in place of your death. The punishment that he received should have been your punishment. The blood that poured out of his body should have been yours, but it was his. And because it was his, it serves not only as a sufficient payment for your sins, but an overwhelming payment for your sins, and not your sins only, but the sins of the whole world. As the hymn says, Jesus paid it all. So Christ died for our sins, and Christ was buried Christ was buried. This too is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's a reminder that Jesus was really dead. It's a reminder that even his initial disciples believed it was over. When Jesus died on the cross, it seemed like all their hopes had died with them. You remember there were two men that were walking on the road to Emmaus on Sunday morning, and they, they said to a, whom they thought was a stranger, was actually was Jesus, he was hidden from their sight, uh, from recognizing him before they knew it was him, they said, we were hoping that it was he that was going to redeem Israel. Luke 24, 21. They hoped that Jesus was the Messiah, but now that's all over. In their minds, how could he be the Messiah if he's dead? They needed a living Christ for the promises of God to be true. With Jesus dead, those hopes had died. Thus, they buried him. Remember, Joseph of Arimathea gave his own unused tomb for the body of Jesus and he and Nicodemus the Pharisee packed the body with a hundred pounds of spices, wrapped it according to Jewish custom, and they placed this massive stone in front of the door. They would have done none of it if they had the slightest expectation of Jesus to live. Moreover, there's no chance they would have done it if they had any suspicion that he was still alive. Of course, the Roman centurion had verified the death of Jesus, pierced his side with a spear, some people think that he was still halfway alive when he went into the tomb. You know, if neither the cross nor the spirit killed Jesus, surely the smothering of all the spices and the wrapping would have finished the job. The point is that Jesus was truly dead. The price was paid. Without the real and verified death of Jesus, we have no payment for our sins. But it was real. It was verified to the point that Jesus was buried in a literal tomb. But then it goes on, the gospel does, and it says that Christ rose again. This is where the good news becomes good. This is why the gospel is the gospel. On the third day, after Jesus gave his life on the cross for our sins, Jesus rose again to new and glorious life. Now we remember the biblical account, how the women who believed in Jesus still wanted to somehow attend to his body and devotion to him, even though they didn't have the opportunity to do so on the day that he died. Why was that? Because the sun had set, the Sabbath had begun, so women really have no choice except to wait until Sunday morning. They start out at the earliest opportunity, right as the light was beginning to break. They go to the tomb with their spices and their materials. Now how they're supposed to move the stone in front of the tomb, that's a piece of the puzzle they didn't solve yet. They hadn't figured it out. All they knew, they needed to get to Jesus' grave. As it turns out, the stone wasn't a problem. Angel appears, rolls back the stone, reveals that the tomb was already empty. Matthew 28, verse 2. Jesus had already departed from the tomb, having risen from the dead, an event unheard of in all history. Several people had been raised from the dead in the past, some raised by the hand of Jesus himself, but no one had ever risen from the dead by their own power. 
Jesus did. Just as Jesus willingly gave up his life, committing his spirit into the hands of God the Father, so did Jesus take up his life again on the third day. Now, what does that show us? It shows us everything. It shows us that Jesus is the Son of God, his deity, Romans 1, 4. It shows us that Jesus truly is Lord and Christ, as Peter said, Acts 2, 36. It shows us that Jesus is the one who will one day judge the world, Acts 17, verse 30, as Paul said to the Athenians. Moreover, it shows us that we have promise of new life in his name. The resurrection of Jesus is the Easter story. It is the reason that the gospel of Christ is good news. Now, I've got to ask you at this point, is this the news that you believe? This is the news by which we can be saved, but we will never be saved if we do not believe it. Now, think of it. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave when? Nearly 2,000 years ago in the past. Work's already been done. Sacrifice already been completed in full. Yet not everyone is saved. Why hasn't everyone in the past 2,000 years automatically been given the promise and assurance of heaven? Because not everybody believes. Jesus' work is done, but it is only effectual for those who have faith. The Apostle John put it this way. 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You need to believe. About this gospel, Paul does put another note in here. He says that it was all done, how? According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Nothing that happened to Jesus was done according to random chance. It was all according to the Bible. It was all according to the revealed plan of God. You say, well, which scriptures? Paul doesn't list them here. For good reason. There's too many. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that speak of the earthly ministry of Jesus, ranging from his family line to the city of his birth to the events surrounding his death and more. Now, to the specific scriptures that speak of his death, burial, and resurrection, again, there are many, but we need look no further than Isaiah 53. We just looked at that at Good Friday a couple of nights ago. The, the entire chapter of Isaiah 53 speaks of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, but it's also very specific along these lines of the gospel. Isaiah 53, 9 and 10 says, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit done in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus died, the gospel, right? Having been crucified next to two robbers, two terrorists. Jesus was buried, part of the gospel. Placed by the rich Joseph of Arimathea in his own tomb. Jesus rose again, the gospel. Having seen the offspring of his church, having his days prolonged. This is the plan of God regarding his son, and it came true to the letter. This is the message regarding Jesus. The good news of the gospel is good. But is it true? You know, the best story in the world does nothing for us if it's just a fairy tale. How can we know that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Well, that's what Paul goes on to describe. We can know that this is true because Jesus was seen. His physical person was witnessed, not just by one, but by many people. Verse 5, and he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. That Cephas, by the way, that Peter... That Peter is mentioned first is not just a matter of historical record. It's a demonstration of great grace. Now, we need to acknowledge that Peter was not the first witness to see the risen Lord Jesus. That privilege was given to Mary Magdalene and the other women who had steadfastly followed Jesus and believed in him. But Paul is not writing of each and every witness. He's naming the ones that the, you know, the Christians in Corinth would have known. And they had personal experience with Peter, or Cephas, as they called him. So it's only fitting that Paul begins his list of eyewitnesses with Peter. The issue of grace is important due to Peter's last final interaction with Jesus prior to Jesus' crucifixion. After boasting how he would never, never leave Jesus, how all the other disciples would abandon him, but how he would never, ever deny Jesus, uh, Peter had a massive reality check. The mighty Peter, the de facto leader of the apostles, did deny Jesus in a major way. He crumbled at the questions of a little girl around a campfire with an eye shot of Christ. Like so many of us, Peter temporarily turned his back on the man he claimed as Lord. Peter failed. 
But the good news for Peter is that his failure was not final. Jesus died for the sins of Peter, just like Jesus died for your sins and that he died for my sins. When Jesus rose from the grave, he made special effort to ensure that Peter knew that Jesus was risen. He said, go tell the other disciples and Peter. Peter had to know. And then Peter saw Jesus. Peter even had a special meeting with Jesus later on, restoring him to full ministry. Peter found forgiveness in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, just like anyone can. And it wasn't just Peter who saw Jesus. It was all the 12. Interestingly, the official 12 had dwindled to 11 after the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. But that said, there were other men present, as acknowledged by Peter when, you know, uh, Matthias was officially added to the number prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Read about it in Acts 1. But just as there was grace shown to Peter and Jesus' resurrection, so was grace shown to each and every one of the apostles. Remember that although Peter denied Jesus in a particular way, all of the apostles abandoned Jesus. Aside from a brief time when John came to stand at the foot of the cross, all the men who faithfully followed Jesus for three years were scattered like scared sheep. And even after Jesus' death, they feared for their lives or were hiding behind locked doors. But we know locked doors are no problem for the risen Christ. Jesus appeared in their midst, showing them the wounds in his hands and his side. Didn't just do it once, he did it twice. Remember, Thomas was not initially with the disciples when Jesus first appeared to them and told them this glorious news. And Thomas stubbornly refused to believe for a full week. Then finally, Jesus does it once more specifically for Thomas, to which Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. Isn't it good to know that the original apostles were not perfect Christians? They were people just like us. They had failings like every man and woman today. And Jesus gave them grace in his resurrection, just like he offers us grace in his resurrection. This is the good news. This is why it's so important for us to believe and to hold fast. Now, one might expect resurrection stories to come from the men that Jesus called as apostles. They might be accused of bias. Are there any accounts of others? Paul says, oh yeah. Verse six, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain in the present, but some have fallen asleep. 500 people. When did the meeting with 500 people take place? Scripture doesn't directly tell us. Uh, many scholars believe it to be the gathering in Galilee when Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Uh, Paul was less interested in giving the details of the meeting than he was giving the, the Corinthians references, eyewitness testimonies. He's basically telling them, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't even have to take Peter's word for it. Go ask the folks from the 500. Most of them are still around today. Shoot them an email, find out. Go check it out for yourself. You know, according to Hebrew law, it only took the agreement of two to three witnesses for a matter to be established as judicial fact. A man could actually be put to death for murder on the basis of the testimony of two to three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. How many witnesses has Paul named so far? 512 and counting. The amount of eyewitness testimony is overwhelming. Now, the objection that comes up to that is, ah, oh, that's just eyewitness testimony. That, that doesn't prove anything. On the contrary, yes, it does. There are two ways of establishing scientific fact, or two ways of establishing fact, I should say. One is scientific testing by which phenomenon can be reproduced or judicial or historical testimony as in a court of law. Historical events, by definition, happened in the past. They cannot be reproduced scientifically. There is no experiment one can set up to prove Columbus crossed the Atlantic Ocean in 1492. All we can do is look at the historical documents. We can look at the evidence that's left behind. We can look at the testimonies of the people who lived at the time. Same thing happens in criminal courts today all over our nation. Evidence is presented to a judge, sometimes the only evidence being eyewitness testimony. The testimony of one person doesn't really count for much, but the more people that corroborate a story, the more likely it's true. How much eyewitness testimony is available regarding the risen Jesus? An astounding amount. Literally hundreds of people saw him alive. And at the time that Paul wrote this letter, those testimonies could be verified. And the value of the testimony is not just seen in the quantity, but also in the quality. Look at verse 7. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. The fact that James is mentioned is incredibly important. This is not 
either of the two Jameses that were part of the, the 12 during Jesus' earthly ministry. This was the James who was a half-brother of Jesus who ended up being a prominent leader in the church of Jerusalem. Now, if there's anyone that's prone to be a skeptic of Jesus' claims to deity, <laughs> his siblings top the list. I know what I would say if my brother came to me with a claim like that. I won't repeat it now. <laughs> they would have heard the stories from Joseph and Mary that, you know, Joseph wasn't really Jesus' father, but it's no doubt that they wouldn't have believed too many of the others. They certainly did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. We read that specifically in John chapter 7, verse 5. Why would they? They were brothers. They grew up next to him. They played games with him. They probably tried to play pranks on him. They would not have given Jesus any more authority than was necessary. No brother does. But something happened. Something massive changed James's mind to where he was convinced that his own half-brother was God. And that he owed Jesus his worship. And what is that going to be other than the resurrection? Jesus was seen by James and it changed his life. He's seen by James, the other apostles. Who the other apostles were, we can't say exactly. The official 12, they're already mentioned by Paul. Second grouping probably included the 12, included James, Jude, who was another half-brother of Jesus. You've got Justice, who was another potential choice to replace Judas Iscariot, other than Matthias. Perhaps some other men who have been with Jesus in his earthly ministry, though not named with the 12. But the point is clear. The risen Jesus was seen by all kinds of people, even the people who were most skeptical towards him during his earthly ministry. They were converted, being convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And then as Paul continues on, he says, and speaking of skeptics, let me tell you one more. Verse 8. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Finally, there was Paul. Paul's own conversion is recorded three times in the book of Acts, and his personal, something, uh, personal testimony was something he often shared, and for good reason. His testimony was powerful, something that he reminds us of in the next couple of verses. But the point here was that Paul was apparently the final eyewitness of the risen Jesus. Paul was not part of the original group of disciples, nor was he included in the group of men and women who came to faith in Jesus in the earliest days of the church. On the contrary, as Saul of Tarsus, as he was previously known, Paul was steadfastly against and opposed to Jesus. And Jesus still appeared to him. And like a baby being born unexpectedly, so was Paul reborn as an apostle of Jesus Christ and an eyewitness of the risen Lord. He could add his own voice to this chorus of testimony surrounding Jesus. Okay, now it brings up a question. What about today? We are nearly 2,000 years removed from Jesus' resurrection. Any eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection from the tomb is long dead, buried, rotted, <laughs> gone. Now, sure, there are occasional stories of visions, some of varying credibility. Some stories are plainly lies. Others are perhaps grounded in truth. But as for anyone actually laying eyes on the physical resurrected person of Jesus of Nazareth, those days are over. Yet it does not stop us from testifying of the risen Jesus. Why? Well, number one, we have the eyewitness testimonies in the pages of the New Testament. The four gospel accounts are based on the testimonies of the men and women who were there. Paul's own letters speak of his experience as well as does the, the book of Acts. And the other epistles, the general epistles, testify of those authors' experience with the risen Jesus. Now, we may not have access to the 500 you know, men and women mentioned by Paul to, to Corinth, but we do have the eyewitness testimonies of the apostles. That's number one. Number two, we have our own personal testimonies of Jesus Christ. Now, no, we've not seen the risen person of Jesus, but we have experienced him through faith. Every single born-again Christian has a real relationship with the real resurrected Jesus Christ. It cannot be otherwise if you are saved. If you do not believe in the risen Jesus, you are not born again, period. But if you are, it means you pray to the living God. It means that you interact with the living God. It means that we've been saved by the living God known in the person of the risen Jesus. You can testify to someone else of Jesus because you know that Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is a fact. It's not some myth based on the imaginations of deluded men. It's not dogma invented by a cultic group. It's historical, factual truth. 
Moreover, this truth changes lives, and that's how we'll end out quickly here with the idea that the gospel is transformational. Transformational. Verses 9 and 10, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Here's where Paul writes of the effect of Jesus' resurrection on his own life. Yes, he was the last to be called by Jesus to be an apostle. He was the last to be called an eyewitness. It was just a privilege to be called. He wasn't worthy to be called, but he was. Paul persecuted the church of God, but something changed. He was given grace. How much grace? An abundance. Three times in one verse, he talked about the grace of God that he received. Grace made Paul who he was, an apostle. Uh, the grace of God was effectual in Paul's life, not being in vain. The grace of God enabled Paul to engage in ministry. Everything that the Corinthians knew of Paul was all due to the grace of God. God transformed Paul totally from the inside out. It changed him from a persecutor to one who was often persecuted. It changed him from one who hunted the church to somebody who planted the church. The grace of God changed everything about him. And, and how did this grace come? Well, this is the whole point why Paul's writing it. It came through the gospel. How is anyone transformed by Jesus through the gospel? When we respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, we are showered by the grace of God. His grace forgives us of every sin, cleansing us from our past, making us who we are now as new creations. His grace enables us to live for His glory, empowering us by the Holy Spirit to, to do things we never thought possible. It shouldn't be possible. Who are we other than wretched sinners? Who is I other than a wretched sinner? And apart from the grace of God, that's still who I am. But in Christ, I am saved. In Christ, you are saved. Because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ, I am what I am, sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit that I might live to the glory of God. That's my testimony, and that's your testimony if you believe. And it can be anybody's testimony if they believe. Verse 11, therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so he believed. So he takes it right back to where he began. He gave this church the gospel and he could testify of the risen Jesus, the grace that Jesus provides. And if Corinth heard it from anyone else, it didn't matter. It didn't change the message because Jesus is the one who changes lives. Jesus is the one who changes eternal destinies. Why? Because Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again, all according to the scriptures. It happened with Paul. It can happen with anybody because it's transformational. What better news is there to share on Resurrection Sunday than the good news? This is the central message of the Christian faith. It's all about Jesus. It's foundational, it's factual, it's transformational. And this is what we celebrate. Please don't just celebrate it one day a year. Celebrate it 365 days a year. Because Jesus was buried, was dead, buried, risen from the grave. We were saved. That's something that ought to come out in our prayers and devotions every morning or evening, whenever you spend time with the Lord. This is the news that ought to be on the tips of our tongues, ready to share with whomever it is that the Lord puts in front of us. If this is the news that changed Paul, if this is the news that changed you, then this is the news that can change anyone, even the hardest of hearts. Christian, hold fast to what you have heard. Do not underestimate the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let this be the news to which you cling every morning and every evening. This is what we need to preach to ourselves all day, every day. Why? Because we sin all day, every day. How many times do you and I fail before breakfast in the morning, much less the rest of the day? Our thoughts turn to selfishness, or we get upset at the news headlines, we get upset at the traffic, get irritated with the dog. Half a dozen things before you even get to the office or school or wherever. It's in those times we need to remember that Christ came, Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, Christ rose again. He did it all according to the plan of God, that God would be glorified, that we might be bathed in grace. It is the truth of that message by the work of that person that we're saved, that we're assured, so we hold fast to it. Hold to it like a life preserver in the middle of an ocean, like a parachute as you jump out of the plane. However you do it, just do it. Hold fast to the gospel, clinging tightly to the risen Jesus because he is our only hope. Some of you today may not have that hope. You may not know that hope because that hope is a person, but you can. Maybe you've been to this point a false convert showing up in church believing in vain. Or maybe you know that it 
you didn't believe. It's just that it didn't matter much to you. I implore you today, cast yourselves on the mercies of Jesus Christ. You have heard the good news. Jesus is the Christ of God, crucified for your sins, risen from the dead. It's a historical fact, and your lack of faith does not change that. One day you will stand before Jesus in all his glory, and you will be judged for your life based on how you responded to his gospel. You know what? Once you've heard the truth, you can't unhear it. Today you know, today you must respond, so respond in humility and faith. Respond with repentance and trust, asking Jesus to save you, and he will. Father, thank you so much for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not just a bunch of words about Jesus, but Jesus himself. You gave your son to come to live among us, that he would die on the cross as a sacrifice, a substitution for our sins to satisfy the righteous wrath that you have against our sins. He was literally buried, and then he literally rose to life. Because he did all those things, Lord, now we can be made the children of God. Now to those who receive him, he gives the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus Christ, your son, And Lord, I would pray that every single person gathered today would be casting ourselves upon Christ, holding fast to the gospel. For some of us, Lord, we've been walking with Jesus for many years. We thank you for what Jesus has done. We never want to take him for granted. We want to hold fast to that gospel by which we are saved. For others, Lord, maybe the very first day they've ever thought about calling upon Jesus as their Lord Help them do so now by repenting of their sins, turning away from those things, and just clinging to Jesus Christ, asking for salvation. Thank you for your promise to save all those who do. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.